Hello, today is December 23rd, 2015. I'm meeting today with Mr. Richard Mann at his home in Millican, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Richard, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. All right. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay, I was born out in the Pawnee grasslands in June of 1921. My father was an attorney, but he got sick and tired of sitting in the office, so he bought a homestead, and that's where I was born. And, uh, but there was only about two years of that out there that uh, before everything dried up, and uh, uh, had an episode with schools where they sent my sister home when she was sick. And um, my mother, rather than letting Dad take a bull up to the teacher, he said, okay, we're moving. So we traded the drive farm for an irrigated farm in West Reedy, 35th Avenue and 20th Street. Oh, wow. Anyway, that's where we spent our time up through the Depression. Uh, brother and I worked for the neighbor for 50 cents a day for a 10-hour day, but we enjoyed that kind of work, so the long hours didn't bother us too much. Uh, we got to know our neighbors pretty well, and all, all of that land now is part of West Greedy, but part of the part of the city. Well, uh, my school is schooling then started at Meeker Junior, or not Meeker Junior High, Westward or Franklin School, which would have been on the corner of 10th Street and 35th Avenue in Green. We had to walk to school, of course, uphill both ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we lived at uh, 410, Box 410, Route 4. Uh, Dad's name was on the mailbox, H.E. Man. Well, I, that got to school as She Man, which would start a fight, which I usually lost. <laughs> but. He man was stuck then, and when I got into high school, they named me as Pee Wee, because I was I didn't get my growth yet. Ah. Uh. So in high school they called me Pee Wee. Well, at the same time we were getting the fact that we were free in, in the farmland, fancy free, doing what we wanted, and we loved it. But all the town and kids in town said, what do you want to be a farmer for? Well, my first uh, get along with the kids in Gritty was that the East Siders were my classmates. Well, another gal and I got the high grades. So what they do, they moved us up with the Cameron Bunch, which were the high snobs which I didn't take the like I wanted to be with my farm buddies. But my dad said, well, uh, for instance, I wanted to take a uh, uh, shop. He said, okay, you take bookkeeping, typing, shorthand, uh, then you can take shop. That's what happened. Well, of course, I didn't mind too much because all the girls were <laughs> in uh, shorthand and typing class, bookkeeping. And uh, that's how I got to know them. But I really wasn't. I was so so tiny and backward. I stuttered. Hmm. Uh, Self-conscious, I guess. And uh, for instance, when I was in high school, I took a speech class. 
I had really a good speech. I got up on the stage, oh my dear mouth, nothing come out. None of thing. So the next time I put I had a speech on plastics. I was starting to learn a little bit about chemistry then. So I had a speech already about plastics. Well I got up on the stage and I was ready to freeze up and the guy in the back row got to teasing me, got me laughing. That did it. I was fine after that. Uh. I gave good speech and uh, something I was interested in. And uh, so then about halfway through high school, I asked her, how many of you guys want to go to college? Well, I was one of them. So they poured their cola on. So uh, my first year of college then was at uh, Colorado State College of Education in Grady, which is now UNC and some of the same students that, uh, but I was planning on transferring to Fort Collins anyway, so that worked out. So that took care of, uh, uh, I graduated in 1939 okay. from high school, and uh, got one year at UNC, and I didn't have enough money. We were still poor. So I hauled beets in the fall of 39 and 40, shoveled my hand in a Model A truck about three times at a whack. It was a big deal. And uh, the boy beat up was on North 35th Avenue in Grady. There's a railroad down there that they're redoing now because they need it. Uh, so my first year was of uh, college was was in Grady, and then I transferred to Fort Collins. And uh, the only thing I goofed up there, I only had one year of ROTC. Well, you had to have two years of basic ROTC and another year to get a commission. Well, I didn't give a darn about commission or anything else. But when Pearl Harbor come along, they, they said, you guys can stay in school. We'll put you in the National Reserve. Stay in school. And we'll at least finish the year. So that's what we did. Well, well can I interrupt you? Uh, talk about uh, uh, December 7th and when you first heard about Pearl Harbor and you were talking about that off camera, about uh, that day when you've heard about Pearl Harbor and your thoughts and what you were thinking. You were by yourself. and Well, I, I really didn't know what to expect when I heard about Pearl Harbor. Except when my brother graduated that, that same year and uh, he had a heart murmur, so he never made it. Uh, but... I had been working three different jobs at CSU while I was going to school. I worked in a Bennett Hotel for my room every other night. I worked in the Coffee Cup Cafe for my meals. And then I worked for the Range and Pasture Management out on the uh, foothills west of Fort Collins. It's a, in the NYA. National Youth Association uh, as another job. And he's wondering, well, how do I, why did I need to do that? My father was a lawyer. The only kind of money he made then was collecting bills. Nobody had anything. Nobody had any money. So he was hit pretty hard with the, by the Depression? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well... But he was still living, trying to buy a farm. Uh, so on top of your three jobs, you also did the ROTC and went to school. So there was, it doesn't sound like there was much time for any free time. Well, I belonged to the livestock club. That was right down my line. I enjoyed that. Especially when we, uh, once a year, we judged the opposite sex. 
like you wouldn't have heard of cows. <laughs> yeah, some of the words are used are interesting. <laughs> anyway, uh, at this time, I met young John Matsushima. And they were, anybody in Japanese said they couldn't even buy groceries. So the guys would get together and they'd buy groceries for them. Mm. And of course, man and Matsushima were close enough that I sat beside them a lot. Well, uh, John stayed in school. And a little sidelight after that, when I graduated from college, I went to work as a teacher at Padreo. And the Matsushima family was part of the, my program. Well, I asked one day, how come John went to college and the rest of you guys are out here picking cabbage? Ah, oh, he was too little. So we sent him to college. <laughs> well, John really went to town. He got his doctor's degree, he did everything. And he taught for years. He probably taught thousands of students. And he's the guy that come up with the idea of cooking and flaking corn for feed. That turned Montfort and far and all these guys loose on feeding cattle. Uh, wow. wow. As John said, I remember my dad talking about feeding cattle in Japan. They cooked the grain. They got more good out of it. So that's how all that started. And John and I are the same age. He's in Platteville. He lives in Fort Collins. I see him every now and then. But he's a little guy, broad shouldered, but I'm sure he could have picked a lot of cabbage. Huh. So you stayed in school. You, uh, so after uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, they kept you in school. All right, yeah. and they, they turned us over to the to the uh, athletic department. That's the best shape I've been in my whole life. Calisthenics, road marches, obstacle course, all that stuff. The uh, foot, football coach was our leader. Boy, he knew how to toughen us up. So, uh, in the, the, I got one quarter or one semester at CSU. Uh, in uh, for would have been forty three, uh, so in May of forty three, those guys that were possibilities of being officers, they sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and the rest of us had already had too much school. They sent us to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and that's where I I wondered why, how in the world did I ever get in a survey with 29th Division. I finally figured out I know how to survey and uh, they need surveyors. Ah, uh, right, right. And, and how was that for you? I mean, like many of your generation growing up, you never really traveled too far away from home. Now you're way over on the East Coast. How was that for you? Was there uh, was oh, I enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah, no, no tinge of homesickness or anything like that? No? No, no I was just... Uh, I'd been away from home enough that, uh, well, I worked for a neighbor and lived, yeah, lived yeah. with him. Well, how was it, I mean, as far as going to the East Coast and meeting different people, like oh, people from New York or uh, the, the South, I mean, different people that you were accustomed to growing no, up with? No, the ones that I can remember were the guys from Brooklyn. Ah. And uh, they never shut up. <laughs> and when they were coming home, they were, the further you went, the nicer Pullman car you got. And they put all the Colorado guys in the car by themselves. It was deathly quiet. What's the matter? Then we all realized we got rid of them loudmouth Brooklyn guys. <laughs> <laughs> so now, did you? That's where you, you took your basic training in North Carolina, then, or right? Okay, yeah. Well, actually, you might say that we were. Really trained at CSU. Okay. Yes, sir. No, sir. Okay. Because we knew what 
discipline was all about. Okay, yeah, so it wasn't much of an adjustment for, for you as opposed to somebody coming fresh into the service. You kind of had had that, a little yeah, bit of that. Had a, yeah, okay. And we, uh, we'd already, well, they were, at that time, they were training with horses and caissons, but the caissons, when the caissons go rolling along, that's what we did. Huh. That's how we trained. But then when we got to North Carolina, there weren't any horses. They were all trucks. Well, I knew how to drive a truck. From your beat days. Yeah. So, uh, that, yeah, I don't know whether I'd give it gun me any points or not, but the only time I ever got in trouble was they, they put my KP and I, uh, what's in the, the mess sergeant, and I said, how come you never smile? He says, when you get done scrubbing all those pots and pans, see if you can smile. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only time I was ever on KP. <laughs> Which I, you know, I, I, I enjoyed the countryside. It was in the tobacco, mm. the uh, peanuts, the cotton, no, that's it. I was an agriculture right, side right. of it. Yeah. So I'm in the water mountains. So I got to see all that while we're on a road march. Uh-huh. So the, the, our training at Fort Bride then was to get us ready for D Day. So. Of course, you didn't know that, though. They didn't tell you that. No, we yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. They just said you're here to kill. Yeah. yeah. Well. I'd had a rifle in my hand most of my life, but I didn't intend to kill anybody. Might kill a few rabbits, but uh, I, I was a pretty good shot. The funny thing I did is I broke, I had broken my left arm when I was a kid, and uh, I thought, well, if they ever get this, see my broken arm, they're going to take me out. But it was perfect for holding a rifle. <laughs> So I was, uh, I could have been a sniper. Fact is, when I finally joined joined the outfit in England, they gave me an O an O three thirty out six from World War One. So what's that for? Well, in case we need a sn sniper, you're it. Well, it never happened. Ah, <laughs> uh, wow. Anyway. Uh, about all I learned at Fort Bragg then was uh, what a 155 Long Tom could do, throw a shell 25 miles, uh, learn how to splice telephone wires, learn how to say yes sir, no sir, uh, learn to love music that was Glenn Miller and so on though. All that stuff. Uh, and then when the, we were trained, I spent some time in the hospital with a broken blood vessel on my leg. Uh, I kept telling the nurse, get me out of here. Get me out of here. So she did. And uh, th that's when I, I and another guy, just the two, left the training outfit first. Well, he, he was a... Uh, airplane mechanic and he ended up doing that and I had been learn, learning to survey so that's what I was, did when I joined the 29th division in, in England so that's I often thought how in the world did they know I knew anything about surveying well they had a better tag on you than you yeah. realized yeah yeah so uh I got the delaying route, come home. I had to borrow money from the Red Cross to to do it. And I uh, got home and then on, when I went back, I had to go back to through Chicago to Fort Meade, Maryland. Uh, that's where they got you ready to go overseas. And then Camp Kilmer is where they fed you up because they, they knew that the British wouldn't feed you for we're good on the ship. What's the way it is? That's about, about what it happened. So 
we we were on the shipping dock at midnight, back on Ace of Spades, getting ready to load up on HMS Mataroa. Now HMS Mataroa was a her Majesty's ship, but what the heck was it doing in the Atlantic? It was a ship from the Pacific. Well, it was a troop ship, what it was. Well, they loaded us up and they took off at midnight in a huge convoy that had everything. Boy, that what that must have been a sight to see all those ships out on the oh, horizon. Boy, there, there were locomotives, airplanes, uh-huh. trucks, everything. Everything that we were going to need. Well, well, that, that that begs the question. Here, here's a farm boy from Landlock, Colorado, going to sea. How was that trip for you? Did you get your sea legs? How was the trip over for you? I was so interested in the trip that I didn't. Guys, I'd hang on with the rail and say, "What's the matter? You sick?" And then I was throwing further than you can, throwing up to. You, but I never got sick. Is that right? Huh? No, I huh. I was enjoying the trip. I had never been on a train. Yeah, right, yeah. I'd never been out of Colorado. Yeah, yeah. I'd never been on an airplane. I'd never been on a ship. So it was all new. And, and, and talk and about... Eating it up. Talk about what life conditions were like on the ship. Your, your sleeping quarters and... The, the, well, I was up in a hammock. Yeah. And when you got up in the morning, you had to pull a hammock up so you can... The table was underneath. That's where you got your... Tomato slop. They wanted to make sure we didn't get the scurvy, so we were eating a blade of bacon floating around in, in tomato sauce. Uh, uh. Vitamin C plus, you know. Well, I hadn't had any nutrition yet, yet at school, but that, that came later. But uh, I got to see whales in the ocean. I got to see the phosphorus in the water at night. Ship going through the water, but we, 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 we the the first first division in twenty ninth had gone overseas on one of the Queens, four days. Yeah, right. Heck, we were two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. Convoy was slow. So, sounds like you uh, spent a lot of time up on the on the on the deck then. Spent oh time, yeah, yeah, all the time yeah. I could. Yeah, except Did, when it got too. Too rough. And did you ever, ever have any worries of uh, German su- subs? Did you? Well, yeah, I think it was probably one time because we were down in the guts. You could see the sides of the ship, and you could feel boom. It was either it was either torpedoes or ash cans. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Depth charges. Boom. Yeah. Uh-huh. You could feel it. You couldn't. You could feel it more than you could. They could hear it. Wow. Uh. So, as uh, far as I know, we didn't lose anybody. But the, the first ship that went to England, a destroyer cut in front of the, the Queen, and they cut her right in half. Hmm. They never slowed down. Wow. Kept right on going. It was full of troops hmm. on the ship. Hmm. So... But most of those people, uh, a big share of them never got to come home. They got there first. Hmm. And there were a lot of old men. I thought they were old men. Uh, some of the guys thought I was old. Yeah, I was, right. Since I was 23. Yeah, right. Yeah. And Chicken Landers was our youngest guy and then we all always picked on him because he was he looked like a kid <laughs> he now, made it through the war now by this time had you filled out had you grown had a growth growth spurt or were you still well i, I tell you i went in the, i went in the service with 100 147 when i come out i went 185 really yeah so i grew up yeah yeah. Well, I grew up more on. Yeah, more here. ways than one. Yeah. No, the only thing I did when they came home, they put us on a hospital train. I thought, what in the world is it for? Hospital train. Well, 
The war was over May. We didn't get home till November. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that. We'll get that into, that into your story. So uh, you go across the the pond. Take about two weeks. Now you weren't in a unit. You were going over as a replacement at that point, right? You weren't in any. I was a I was a replacement through the whole war. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. All right. So you land in England. Yeah. T take your story from there. Well, the ruffle depot mm -hmm. <laughs> is what everybody. You stay here until we assign you. Well, I was never alone. And the, the outfit was in Seton Barracks in Plymouth, England. I'd been there before. I was there in 1620. Richard Mann left Plymouth, England in 1620. Oh, wow. On the Mayflower. So I knew all about that. <laughs> I was living history. So they, they tra traveled across uh, England with a little tink, 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 train. That's the whistle. And a nice little compartment that you, you rode in. And uh, one of these pictures shows uh, me standing in front of a building. Well, that was Seton Barracks. And when we went back over there in the, in the 90s, I tried to pick the same spot to another picture but that's another story yeah we'll tell yeah yeah okay when we went yeah went to do that uh, so we did some more training in england like marching fire we would fire just ahead of the infantry with our shells the infantry would get up and run then we fire ahead marching fire they called it so that they had confidence that we could put the shells where we wanted them, and uh, that way they had a chance of getting the guys before they got out of their foxholes. And uh, so our final, we all just said, we had one more, I know you heard the slapped in sands. No, talk about that. Explain what that is. Anyway. Things happened at Sapton's hands that they wanted to be kept secret for 40 years. The Germans had gotten in there with their PT boats, so what I called them, and they got into the 4th Division and they killed like 400 and some guys. Uh, that's when they were practicing for D-Day. Yeah, practice well, we beach landings. Yeah, well, we were practicing well, beach landings, right? We heard, we yeah. heard a bunch of... And the LSTs got blown up and... And actually what we did, we loaded on a, a landing craft tank. Uh-huh, LST. And we waterproofed the trucks so we could drive in the water. Only thing you had to do was make sure you seal the hole on the carburetor before you went in the water, which we did. And it was... Successful, but slapped in sands is where we got our first taste of amphibious landing ship tank. Uh -huh. But then we 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 got on a landing ship tank, landing craft tank, and the landing ship tank. Like the ship had double double decks. Right. When when we finally got on the channel, so. We, we trained there, and then... D during this time you were training, did you have furloughs to, to go into London? or? Oh, or yeah, I got to London and Bath. And, what, and once again, here's this Colorado farm boy. Uh, that must have been exciting for you. But the, the incident that I remember the best was on Easter Sunday, another guy and I went to church. And when we come out of the church, this couple were standing there, and they wanted us to go to dinner with them. Oh. And their old grandpa and the family had been a student at Mines. Oh, really? So we made a connection. Okay. But I never got names. You were, you were careful about all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But we had a nice little beef roast, and we had tea and crumpets, and they were very nice to us. Huh. And... Uh, that was our memory of this Easter Sunday of uh, 19, 
44. Yeah, 44. Yeah. Yeah. And he also said off camera that uh, you were there during the buzz bomb bombings. and. Yeah, you hear those things going over. Uh. Sound got to be pretty important because when the, when they got on shore, you had to know where the war was going on. So if you heard, burr, 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 that was a German machine gun. We know where the front was. And of course, if they throw an 88 at, at, oh. at you, you know where they were com coming from. Mm -hmm. So, we, uh, first thing they did, they put us in a camp in England and took everything away unnecessary. We, you know, you gather junk. As you go along, and they didn't want you hauling all that crap across the water. So, we uh, got all that stuff taken away from us, and then they loaded us on a LST, landing ship tank. Now, by then, you were put in the 29th, you were in the 29th by then, or had you put it been well, assigned right, it? Well, I, I went to the 29th Division right away. Right away, okay. That's why I, I often wonder why. That's because I was considered a surveyor. Okay. I think. I couldn't, wouldn't be sure, but I think that's why. I often thought, why? How in the heck did I get to that point? Point. I knew I was a good shot. I was a good driver. Uh, I was old enough to know better. I was old enough to chase the girls, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the English girls didn't have any teeth because they were nutrition. The, the French girls had, had teeth, but we didn't have time. <laughs> we were too busy yeah. protecting our butt. Yeah, right. So... We loaded on these LSTs. Well, talk about, uh, I always hear from all the guys who were in that, during that time period, the night before when, and during the day, with the, 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 they said the skies almost turned black with all the airplanes in the air. Do you remember that at all? Or? Well, no, I don't. Uh, yeah. I knew all that. I know what a P-38 was, and a P-47, C-47, B-29, B-17, I knew what all of them were, but I'd never been on one. Yeah, right. Only thing I ever did is they bragged so much about, boy, we did a perfect job that time. For instance, they, they were to bomb a railroad one time next to a village. They missed the railroad and wiped out the village. Oh, boy. Wow. Well, and there's so many of my uh, classmates, like... Uh, Dick Monfort was Warren Monfort's son, and I'd gone to high school and college with him, and he was on a bomber crew that got shot down, and he was killed. Hmm. Uh, but they, I think they, uh, they over, I think they overdo the flight guys. They either had it awfully good or not at all. They got shut down, or yeah, they yeah, right. They lived through it. So you get on the the LST. Uh, is that when they finally announced? Okay, this is this is the invasion. Is that when you first found out what was going on, or when did you find well, out? We know. Oh, okay. We know we were ready for the yeah. landing. Uh, they got us on this LST. Of course, we had to spend one day because the water was too rough. And that's when they loaded these uh, 105s on the, a duck, amphibious truck, and uh, which wasn't very successful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So that, that would have been like uh, the fourth, maybe, that we loaded on the ship. And then we were ready, supposed to ready for the fifth. Right. But we didn't go in until the sixth. Right, yeah. But in the process of going across the ocean, we're on the LST. First thing they did is issued a brand new blanket to you. 
And then they said, come up and we'll feed you beans. That's all they had was beans. Hmm. Of course, they, t- they were hot, tasted good. So we in the bar, down in the bottles of this LST. It's like a big whale. Right, right. Well, we got it about six miles out from France, and they pulled us rhino barge up to the front of the LST. We drove off onto the rhino barge. Whole mess. Huh. Tanks, tractors, trucks, airplanes, anything that we needed was loaded on this barge, which was just steel containers welded together, and they were going to use that for a, a dock when we got done with it. Well, it was guided by an engine here and an engine here. They wanted to turn it. Speed this one up or this one. So the first thing we did, we run, we run into a French troop ship, put a great big dent in the front of it. And I thought, boy, what'd that do to us? Nothing. Huh. <laughs> huh. So then we we went across to the, we were supposed to be H plus 30 minutes. Well, we tried to go in and land it. Drove a jeep off the end, he went out of sight. Pulled the driver back up on. Then backed off, tried another spot, run the cat off. It went out of sight. So we went, pulled back, and now the, the, the timing was almost perfect because uh, we were supposed to be H plus 30 minutes while I was in. The afternoon when they finally got that thing lined up to get us off of there. Well, there was a deal. Now, I figured this out later on. There was a lull between the machine gunning when they were crossfire killing so many guys. There was a lull where they finally got them shut off and they were ready to use the 88s. Well, there was, must have been a time period in there where we got on shore without being hit. And uh, I got the truck on the shore, but now what do I do? Now, which which beach did you land on? Dog Red. That was on Omaha? Omaha. Omaha, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's the one where the next morning... There were bodies. Now, I, I think for a long time I shut all that out. There were bodies either drowned or shot. Cordwood. Oh. From mile down, down to where the first division was. So these were all our guys that were dead. Uh, either drowned or... Well, once again, I, I keep going back to this this innocent Colorado farm boy. I mean, to to see that sight, I just can't imagine what what would go through a person's mind. Well, uh, part of my character is if I don't something I don't like, I blank it out. Okay. Now there are times that I cannot I cannot remember a darn thing. Huh. Which because is probably I, good. I blanked it out. Yeah, which is probably good. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So you get off the barge and you 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 don't you're not sure where to go from there then? Um, no, it weren't. Huh. So uh it was Lieutenant Conover, second lieutenant, Corporal Sitzman and I. Three so guys on the truck. Well we parked the truck. Well they were starting to shell then. So we got the heck off of that. And God, there was a strip about this wide that had mining, mine signs on both sides. I took mining. Well, you know, it'd stay on, stay on the path. Well, uh, about that time, the guy said, don't stand around down there. That ammunition truck's going to blow up. It was burning. Well, 
I thought that was the last of my truck. We left, got on the, this path, and the three of us, and then we kind of moved back and forth with the way the shells were falling. Oh. And we'd go through an area where somebody had just been hit. Now, this one I don't like to, to, like to tell, but they, they said there's going to be shell holes for you to hide in. Well, the only shell holes is one that were, they were making. And this guy was taking a crap down in one of these shell holes. Good looking athletic guy. We went by one time. He was in the posse. Come by next time he's dead. Oh, well. And just before we got, uh, there was a concrete uh, wall that stopped us from going any further. Well, the tank had gotten that far, and the driver was still in there. I'd been to the mat in two sods in London, and the waxworks was, they, they had no color. That's what this guy looked like. He was sort of gray looking, sitting at the controls. Yet, that uh, concussion, I think, had probably killed him. Hmm. Wow. So, that, that was one of the guys that I saw killed. Funny thing of it is, I never had one of my close friends, them few of them wounded, but I never had one of them. Uh. Killed, so I managed to get home. Yeah, with that part of my oh good psyche. Yeah, cl kind of clean. Yeah. Anyway, when we got on the on the beach, then we followed this trail, and uh, just to the right it was Point de Hawk. That's where the Rangers had mm -hmm. had to go up, and there was they bombed. The thing to the the bomb pits are still there. Well, the fact is, they haven't touched them. They're still mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's where we ended up the next day. And uh, one of the officers down there said, you two guys go down to the 1st Division and see if we got any artillery. Well, the story on that artillery was, they were on these uh, uh, amphibious trucks, and they were overloaded. And the water would fill them up. They'd go down, turn over, jump the gun out, and come back up. Hmm. This, this one guy that we helped back up on the, on this barge said, uh, well, I was in that thing. I got tangled up in a camouflage net, and I couldn't get loose. But I could hear blah, 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 blah. The bubbles, blah, 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 I was going down. The gun fell out and the thing came back up. That's how he made it. So you knew there were a lot of them got drowned. Because hmm. that was, uh, the Navy guys were doing their job, but they wanted to get the heck out of there. So, so many, so many times they were in charge of the boat rather than having the, the army guys in charge of it. So they wanted to get rid of you, get the heck out of there so, so they could survive, which happened so many times. Hmm. Wow. Well, uh, so the fir first time I got hit, I crawled underneath this truck and the shells were coming over. And uh, one come over, wham, I was hit. I did like this. Of course, I said, I'm, I'm hit. The officers looked down there. I did like this. I was expected to see blood. It was grease off the bottom of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <wow. laughs> we could laugh. That's my first laugh, see. Well, what's it like? I mean, here I, I'm a person that's never been in, in battle, never been in war. What's it like to be in an artillery barrage? I mean, it's got to be terrifying, I would think. Well, the first place is you want to be down. Now, 
any any barrage that we got into later on, we were generally dug in. But like the time when we were in in, uh, in Brest, we got bombed at night, and I got checking and I couldn't shut it off. And I thought I was, the dirt's going to fall in on me. I was checking so hard. Well, we had a church service the next Sunday, and the, the uh, chaplain asked, and you boys have troubles getting the shakes the other night? I felt better after that. He did, too. Hmm. Anyway, there were so many times that uh, all it would have taken is a piece of shrapnel or a bullet or most anything that I would either have been buried over there or I'd have been wounded. Yeah, right. But I went the whole time without them. And I, after I got home, I thought, well, they were praying for me. And these were blessings. Each time that that happened, it was another blessing. And there were a dozen of them. Yeah. The, bless, the blessing when the when I woke got up in the morning, I went to put my boots on. There weren't any eyelets left in the boots. They were all blown out. My shoulder half was full of holes. Wow. The, 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 uh, they called them uh, daisy cutters, the bomb that dropped mm -hmm. it and mowed the grass. Punctured gas tanks, flattened tires, all kinds of stuff. But the, the only time it got, got hit that time was under, under a tree and the shrapnel got his feet. Anyway, that was about, I don't know where my numbers are. That was one of the times I got by. And, oh, the second day, we were walking down to the first division, and they said, get out of there, and the, the bullets went right over her head. I guess it, I could hurt him. Wow. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, and I thought later on, that gum, in fact, had this scope, I'd have found that guy, and I'd, I'd nailed him. You know, he, uh, that took care of the beach, and and uh, we, we went to uh, um, the sub pens. Oh, okay. And I just I got to war over again. And we we went went down there at night. Oh, I had the worst headache because they took everything away away from me, glasses, anything to re reflect took it away from me, so I drove, drove with the cold wind in my face. Boy, I got a terrible headache. Got over it. So then, uh, when we got done at Brest, we'd wiped out another infantry unit. Uh, we were going to have a break. So the general got on the plane and went to England. They couldn't find him. <laughs> they wanted us to go. They wanted us up north in Auckland. So we loaded up and took off. Convoy. Went through Paris. That's the first time I went through Paris. Convoy. Kept right on going. Come out at Auckland and had to dig in. And... Uh, Somewhere in there is where we start using the proximity shell. What just we shoot the shell and then it would explode above the foxholes. Pretty soon they had all the holes covered. <laughs> but the first time we caught them pretty good. Anyway, that that time uh, that's when I got to know the Dutch people. I loved that country. They were nice. Spoke good English. Uh, the the Englishman, you, you, I tell you, man. Uh, <laughs> of course, the French. 
Comper par la Francais. <laughs> and the German spoke the Dutch. Uh, the Dutch spoke good English. And they were nice. And clean. We could take a whole convoy through town, leave all the mud. They were not, the sound was not the same. They were out there cleaning up. Washing it down. They had lots of brick streets, so the mud shook up. So when we got to the sports, sports plats, P-L-A-T-G, the place where they had sports stuff, and they were dug in. And we, we lost, killed a lot of guys, our own guys. They were trying to take that. But uh, I don't know how that general could live with himself because we were, they always said that the 29th Division was three. With a division on the ground, with one in the cemetery and another in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the reason Probably the reason that I made it was I had my curiosity under control. I didn't look over a hedgerow, inspect a bullet. Uh, and I, was, I guess I was lucky, no way. Like when, during the Battle of Bulls, we were up under Montgomery, up north. So they sent us back down to help out. Well, we were on one street. And there's a German tank on the next street. Well, about the time we got down there, I had to make a turn around, and a thunderbolt come overhead, knocked the tank out. Wow. Well, about that time, that's where the, my truck was on fire. I didn't know why. The horn oil, the horn oil was shortened out. So I stripped the insulation off. We got the heck out of there. Well, I figured, now that should have been a Purple Heart right there. Hmm. But it wasn't, it took care of itself. Yeah. You yeah. Know, the, the burn. Yeah, yeah. So then the next, the next time, I and another guy was standing guard. Uh, uh, during the middle of the winter of 44, we got up to Ulick. Uh, on the side of the river Zurich, and that's where we're going to spend the winter. Well, they sent us from from there to Bastogne to back, give them back up. Oh, boy. Well, we went back up there and dug in for the winter. Now, were you part of a battery, or what What was your, you were, were you doing surveying at this point, or? And, uh, yeah, you, I surveyed. You were part of, the, of a battery, or did you work with all well, the batteries? I or? was in headquarters battery. A uh, headquarters battery, okay. Headquarters battery. Told them where to shoot. Okay. Give them a survey point so they could know where to shoot. And, uh, of course, at the time, I didn't know I was a dummy. I didn't. I just go along for the ride. Yeah. Do what I was told. And, uh, of course, I kept maintenance on the truck, make sure. And th that's when the weapons carrier ended up being the best vehicle. The Jeep was too low. It got hung up. The 6x6 had duels. Well, the front wheels would make a track, but the rear wheels wouldn't track. But the 4x4 four four, the Dodge weapons carrier, the tracks went the same. Put chains on it, you go, you go anywhere. So that's what I was driving. And, uh, and when we got to... Uh, once in Gladbach, so supposedly this where Goebbels' castle was. Well, we found a Stutz Burkett car with bucket seats. Well, I swiped one of the bucket seats, put it in my truck. <laughs> <laughs> and my sergeant said, why did, you, why did you get that other one for me? <laughs> <laughs> How was that period of time for you? Because it was during that period of time during the bulge, you guys were going through one of the coldest winters in Europe's history. 
Were you properly, did you have proper clothing? Were you, were you staying warm enough? Well, I think we were lucky. They assigned us to Montgomery. He would never do anything until he was oversupplied. Well, I had a sheepskin coat. I had boots, overshoes. I had everything that was necessary for cold weather. Didn't bother me a bit. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Good. No, I'd been used to wearing overshoes. Yeah. Shoes in the cow muck. Right, right. At home. And uh, so we were, we were ready with the cold weather coming along. Well, there's one place we found a pile of briquettes, coal. Kept it covered up. Every now and then we'd go get another load. So we, the building that we were living in was all sh shot up, knocked down, but was out of the wind. So that's where we had our little fire. And uh, that, that winter was fairly decent. Oh, okay. Except for the day that I was supposed to stand guard. It was a, it was like a moat in a headquarters building. And then, you know, they had horses and cows and everything. Had a room for them. Well, they were gone, but we'd taken over this, this uh, farm, I suppose you'd call it, for headquarters. And, uh, but I was standing guard under this archway with an infantry guy, infantry guy and I swear they must have s could see us. Figured that was headquarters. Anyway, here comes Shell. Oh, jeez. Landed out there. Of course, we hit the dirt. Then the Shell. We hit the dirt again. One of us said, I ain't going to stay out here, get killed. So we went down the stairway and into a square room. The next shell took the stairway down behind us. We couldn't get out. Oh, man. We were AWOL. We left our post without being, being relieved. But the, the fire control was in the next room. Of course, there was a big laugh then. Ah, you guys are gonna, you're in trouble. Left your post. <laughs> yeah, we're alive. <laughs> they, they said later on that they weren't shooting at us. They were shooting at that church that was mined all the way around. They figured we'd been in the ch church. But I swear the guy that was shooting those shells was looking right at us. And they figured if they're going to, if they're guarding that thing, that's where the headquarters. Why well, it was too. The fire direction center. Hmm. So that was uh, uh, probably about number ten blessing that I got. And uh, the best story he had when he got to the Rora River, it was really. We were on one side and Germans on the other, and this uh, Crow Griffin, uh, he got his name because he shot a crow in the convoy one time. Uh, he'd uh, gotten an elephant gun from this Gobel, like Goebbels castle, and uh, it was a hunting resort. He got this thing, he said, I was returning fire with that thing. But he said, uh, there was, he smoked cigars, but there was sparks all around. I was trying to stomp them out. There were, there were treasure bullets, and I thought it was my cigar. Now, what, <laughs> what he just made that up or not? Uh, in that, wow. Yeah, he and the other guy were our fifty caliber machine gunner guy to keep the planes away. And uh, this one time they got a hold of a bunch of hooch and they were drunk and skunk. And they'd shot a cow. 
And there they come dragging that cow back to the outfit. They dragged a while and they fall down. <laughs> drag it a little bit further. But we had fresh meat. <laughs> but those two made it to the war. Uh. They were nuts. But they, they'd they been in there with the National Guard for a long time before I ever got there. So when the war time was over, most of those guys had enough points. So they came home early. And though I had 70 some points, uh, they put us on a hospital train. Now, just to explain for those that are watching this tape, you, to, to get out, to return home, you had to accumulate so many points to come home. And that included, uh, oh, if you were married, how long you were overseas, if you were wounded. I mean, that added points up, right? And, and, and you had to stay there until you had enough points to come home, right? Is that's, yeah, yeah. So how far did you get, where were you uh, when VE was announced, VE Day was announced? How far? Uh, Almost up to the North Sea. Oh, really? So we actually, when we, when they got ready to come home, they put us on a dilapidated train and shipped us clear to Marseille, clear across Germany and France to Marseille. Now, was there any, you know, at this time, uh, I mean, the war in Europe was over, but the war in Japan wasn't, or in the Pacific. Was there any concern that you might be uh, transferred to uh, the Pacific Theater? Not us, but I, I got involved with the officers that were being shipped over there. As we figured that for the, the uh, headquarters brother Kirk and I were good friends. So he said, hey, Dick, be my assistant driver. We're going to take these officers down to Luxembourg to fly. Didn't know where they were going to fly somewhere. Okay. So after the war was over. So we took them down there and, and uh, unloaded them. They said, you guys get place to sleep and see in the morning. <laughs> Well, we had legal papers, so we took off. They were gone. Uh, we knew. We knew they'd never bother us. Yeah. <laughs> so we spent two weeks just covering the ground that we didn't get to look at very good the first time. And we never went anywhere, but what the Twenty Third Division was known so well that we never looked at food, gasoline, anything. Huh. Was free, so we enjoyed that. So when I got back to the outfit, at, uh, well, Nordenham was where we ended up, outside of Bremen. When I got back to the outfit, I was supposed to have gone to. I signed up to go to school, and I said, "Well, they sent somebody else." And uh, so the uh, master mechanic had gotten home. So they made me master mechanic for a while. Oh, man. <laughs> so now at this point, you guys are part of the occupation forces? Yeah. Okay, okay. And we, we, we did some occupation. We'd get out early in the morning and look, see if we could find some German soldiers somewhere. We'd, look, we'd always go to the chicken house, get the eggs, go to a locker or somewhere, see what was in there. And uh, that was sort of fun, but the the German houses stunk. You know, they kept them closed up tight. And then they, they kept didn't they keep the livestock on in the bottom part of the house? And they lived upstairs. Well, they didn't there, but yeah. then they just kept them closed up, kept warm. Ah, uh. because there weren't any supplies for them. But so many, I think there are a lot of those farmers that were completely out of the war. They were producing food. That was their part of it. But they didn't know anything about what, like uh, the Jews, oh, Jews okay. being okay. slaughtered. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you have a lot of interaction with the civilians? Did you did you mingle with it, like the Germans or the French or the uh, the Dutch when you went through those countries? Well, the Dutch people did because they spoke such good English, and they were nice. 
But then the, we went on break one time, and he said, take your truck. Go pick up DPs. Well, by the time the war was over, the, all those people that had been slave labor were coming out of the holes everywhere. Hmm. Get them off the highway. We need... We're still hauling gasoline and ammo up front. So we'd go pick them up. Uh, get their nationality, Ruski, uh, French or whatever you were. And then we had a camp set up that we'd take them to. And the first thing they did, they'd, they'd uh, de louse them. You know, a woman, they'd go, whoosh, whoosh, hmm. with DDT oh. to control the. Uh, yeah. So what was it? Disease that the lice spread. Uh, not malaria. Yeah. Uh. Any, anyway, that was the purpose of that. But to get them off the highway. Now, d during this time, I had a young fellow work for me at Johnstown. That his family. And I asked him one day, where were you? Well, my dad said I was a baby. I was a good baby. They'd hide me in the bushes. I wouldn't cry. Well, this one time, they had a Russian truck here, an American truck here. They put the baby buggy on the Russian truck. I put the baby buggy on the ground. They put the baby buggy on the American truck. I leave it there. That's how I come to America. Hmm. Vudilak, Ukrainian. Wow. And that was just some of the best help that I ever had. Hmm. That guy didn't do anything. The, describe uh, as you went uh, as you went through Europe uh, the scenery, what uh, the, the devastation. Can you talk a little bit about? Remember what you're seeing? Uh, the countryside, the villages. Well, uh, if you'd seen this. Little Thompson River after the flood. That's just about what we left. It's either flooded, blown up, floated away. We didn't leave anything. Well, either they shot it up or we did. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, wor the worst thing I hated was they'd, they'd say, uh, take your truck and this winch pull those horses out of the barn, they were killed. Big work horses, beautiful. Pull them out and then they'd have to bring a bulldozer in, bury them. But the war, war didn't pay attention to livestock. Like one time there was a, the side of this house was blown out and there was a goat on the bed, standing in the middle of the, the bed. Huh. He survived. Wow. Uh. But, you know, you kind of felt sorry for the people that had to stay, live in these villages. And uh, there weren't too many of them that weren't bombed one time or another. Hmm. So then how long after the war then were you uh, over there as part of the occupation forces before you were able to come back well, home? Well, May, May the 8th, and then it was November. Oh, really? That long? Oh, wow. Wow. And they put us on the hospital train. Well, uh, I think a part of this was getting us slowed down. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Because if, when you're in combat, man, you're tuned up. So... By the time we got down to Marseille, we were pretty well uh, goofed up and then raising hell wherever we could, taking pictures and eating food whenever they give it to us. Well, one question I always like to ask is, you know, as you cross Europe and you're in constant combat and fighting, I mean, you, you think about it, if you look, if you really think about it, you're out in the elements, you weren't probably eating as well as you could hygiene probably wasn't so good you probably weren't getting enough sleep 
I mean, I mean, any one of those things I think would knock a man down. But you had all of that coupled with the, the stress of war on top of it. How do you think you made it through that period of time? What what? That's what we trained for. So you think your training prepared you for no, that? I trained for for that, we, and we uh, well, just like what they did to Fort Collins. We, that's the best shape I was ever in my life, physically. And then, of course, they tried to get food to us when they could, and the K rations supposedly were. Uh, have you ever seen a K ration? Uh huh. I got a ammunition box, some in it. Uh, with a bunch of letters. But you know, uh, I look back through my letters, they don't tell you a damn thing. Well, that's another thing, another question I always like to ask, too. I mean, today we've got computers and cell phones and, and, and instant messaging. What option did you have for communication back in that day? Just letters, right? The V-mail? Yeah. But you couldn't run anything. They Censored it? it? Yeah. yeah. I got away with it one time. I borrowed money from the Red Cross uh -huh. in North Carolina right, to, to get, get home. home. Uh -huh. So, before before we went to France, I figured, well, I might well better pay that off. So I paid it off in Plymouth. I sent the receipt home to Dad. Plymouth. Ah. Apparently, <laughs> done thing. But he didn't notice. Uh -huh. If he did, he didn't say anything about it. He would have known exactly where I was. Yeah, yeah. And how was it once you got over on the continent, you were on the front line, uh, was it mail able to keep up with you? I mean, were you getting mail? Oh, yeah, pretty yeah. much. And, and how long would it take something to go back and forth? Well, for instance, uh, Christmas time, like this time of year, yeah. we were up there in northern Europe, and they, we'd come down towards the bulge, and they put us in a, it was like this building. These are all concrete walls. Oh, wow. And they had all of the Christmas mail. They passed it out. I got a box of cookies. Crumbles. Crumb, crumbs? <laughs> <laughs> but I, that was one place that I could really remember because it was Christmas time and we were safe. And they finally got, the mail caught up with us. Oh, boy. Uh. But the 29th Division was always on the front line. So uh, if anything had to be done, we did it. And at the same time, it's like Patton. When he was moving, he got the supplies. So when we were doing things, moving, we got the supplies. And, and how was it to, uh, to, to be under Montgomery? What, what did you think of Montgomery? I know there's... There's different philosophies and thoughts about him. What were your thoughts about him? Or did, and did you ever... Well, you sit one spot too damn, too damn long. He had, he had to have everything ready to go, which maybe was all right. I don't know. But, uh, of course, we wanted to be with our own outfit. But he needed more troops on the north end after uh, Market Basket at... Uh -huh. uh, in Holland, so we were part of those. Hmm. Did you ever get a chance to meet him or come close to him? Oh, no. No, uh, yeah, okay. Actually, if there's anything going on, we're always too close to the front. Ah, uh, for him to... If Glenn Wheeler was there, he was in England. Uh -huh. <laughs> if there was anything like that going on, there were words fairly safe. Uh, so moving ahead then, so you you, you get uh, taken down to Marseille, I imagine one in, in one of the cigarette camps there, uh, Lucky Strike, or uh, was that where you were? Uh, well, let's see. The Lucky Strike camp was up north. Oh, north, oh, okay. We went through it. Oh, okay. All I remember about that was they had a bunch of these pith helmets they were given given away. I got one home and the kids lost it. <laughs> anyway, uh, they had a, the camp set up in Marseille in the cliffs. They had movie 
screens back in the canyons and here, here and there. But that was, that was then the guys were shooting dice, playing cards, anything. But you couldn't go to town. If you went to town, you come back naked. They didn't. They didn't have anything, so they take what you had. Ah. Uh. But when they got time to finally got on the Victor ship, go out through the Mediterranean, then the blue water and the rock of Gibraltar, and heading home. Trouble that is, when we got almost to New York and the North Sea, we had 50-foot waves. Oh, I heard about those. Yeah. Woo! I heard they were terrifying, almost as terrifying as being in battle. That they oh, were so, man. Yeah. Uh, they had all the portholes shut. Huh. And you, you'd be on the top of a wave, and you'd look down, there's a little boat down there. How, how in the world? We, we had to stay out there for a little, a little while because uh, they didn't want to lose him. Uh, uh, of course, it, it is crazy. Going over, a lot of them got sick. Going home, nobody was sick. Really? Huh. They turned us loose in the food locker. He'd take what you want, guys. Of course, apples and stuff like that we were glad to get. Huh. Wow. And you came back, you landed in New York? Yeah. Yeah. Camp Shanks. Did you go past the uh, uh, Statue of Liberty? I don't think so. Oh, okay. But I'd been there a couple of times. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the best, best thing I remember about uh, Camp Shanks was that they separated us. The further you went, the better the car. Rural car. So, the, the guys going to uh, Washington got the best one. The guys going to Colorado got the next one. And uh, when we got loaded in there, there was something was wrong. It was too quiet. Way too quiet. We got looking around, and then we all started laughing. Those damn Brooklyn guys. We got rid of them. <laughs> they never shut up. <laughs> they never shut up. Yeah. Boy, it must have been a hell of a feeling to be back home and uh, or heading home, anyhow, back in the States and away from what you just been experienced. I bet you were just a great feeling to be on that train heading west. Well, the, the experience I remember the best was when I was going back. I got, went to... Uh, Station Denver, and uh, I had tickets to go through Chicago to Fort Meade, Merton. And uh, the conductor said, I, Hey, soldier, come on. come on. He put me on the city of Denver. And I had, I had almost dreamed about that because all the history of the city of Denver. I could hear it going through Greedy. Ah, oh, right. And that went 60 mile an hour, see. So I had to, I was waiting for that. In fact, his train, trains have always been in my memory because where I was born was eight miles from the end of the track at Purcell. Uh. And when the Jack Rabbit special went out there, you could hear the whistle. Oh, wow. Uh. So when we got on the train uh, the first time, all I can remember is it was raining like hell. And they had that, it was a steam engine. They had that thing going wide open. Uh, they had free use of the, of the tracks. Uh, Getting ready for war. Wow. wow. So you take the train home from... Uh, Camp Shank, and then uh, were you discharged here in Colorado then, or where? Yeah. yeah. Fort Logan. Yeah. Yeah. And how was that homecoming when you got home and uh, saw your folks? Well, it was about Christmas, about this time. Was it? Oh, yeah. that's, oh boy. Oh, I, it was. Yeah. What the heck? 
of course I was glad to get home. Yeah, yeah. But there wasn't any. Yeah. Uh, I know they'd been praying for for me, because my sister said uh, said one time, "What's this mean? Gun replacement?" So the, on on June the sixth or seventh, when I got up in the morning, first thing come on mind was gun replacement. Well, we'd lost all of our guns in the channel. Mm -hmm. They'd gone over, mm -hmm. dumped them out. Mm -hmm. The fact is, we were worthless as far as the war was concerned for a couple of weeks until they got us some new guns. Mm. Oh, the old guys are there, trained and everything, but no guns. Yeah. Uh, wow. We got one gun, one out of 12. Mm. They were like, I think you said 30,000 ducks a piece. And, uh, uh, only one of them come in and the first division had it uh -oh. so we couldn't even uh, do our part of the war actually we were supposed to be if you couldn't do anything else you were infantry right yeah. well that didn't seem anybody to shoot at they all kept their head down Yeah, it must have been a hard time for your folks and your family with you overseas because they would censor anything you would write, so they didn't know. And, and coupled with the fact that mail took so long to get back and forth, they really didn't know what your situation was. That, that must have been tough for your folks and your your, your, your brothers and sisters. And Well, I remember my, my, see, my birthday would have been June 24th, so in uh, 44... Forty-four. I would have been uh, twenty-three. Yeah, and I got a Waltham watch that they got. Watch is so hard to get then. Before the war was over, everybody had a watch. Germans made them, the Japs made them, better than we did. Ah, uh, wow. Everybody wanted. Uh, some sort of uh, souvenir. souvenir. Uh -huh. I know. I'll have to show you mine. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to see that when well, we're done. Yeah. I have to go up and start yeah. my stairway. Uh, so when I got back to Fort Collins, who's missing? Who didn't make it? Well, He was, he was directing fire, and they got him with a mortar. There were quite a few of the, 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 the second Louis that were trained as observers directed at artillery fire. A lot of them didn't make it because they stand right out there in the open. Right, yeah, with the, the front lines there. See yeah. what they were doing. Yeah. How was that for you after, you know, you were overseas, you were in, in combat, you saw all this stuff. Now you're back. You're back in the states. You're a civilian now. Was that much of a transition to go from what you just experienced back to the calmness of uh, of being a civilian? Did you ha did it take Did you have nightmares? Anything sort of? Uh, well, you know they call well, it PTSD. I had more now than then. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, I blacked out. I didn't black out. I blocked out unpleasant things. In other words, I. I remember seeing all those dead bodies on June the 7th. Yeah. But I knew there was a job to do, so I blocked it out. I couldn't bring him back to life, so I had to go down and see what what we could do about winning the war. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh. So you came back uh, about this time. Did then did you start school back up in 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 the spring, or when did you did well, take some time? Well, uh, my cousin was up born a hole and through the mountain, Alva Adams Tunnel. So he invited me up. I went through the tunnel with him, and then my brother uh, was a agronomist. And he moved to Tucumcari, New Mexico, where 
where they were building the reservoir, teach them how to irrigate. So I spent uh, the summer down there with him. And then before I came home, I, my first airplane flight was, was between uh, California and Denver. Oh, wow. I rode a train from, from Tucumcari, New Mexico, to uh, California. I had a load of furniture and a, a pregnant mare horse that I'd take care of to get him to California. So uh, that was kind of fun. Uh huh. And uh, and my my older sister was he he was a supervisor being uh, with Lockheed making. Uh, lighting airplanes and uh, so she showed me around California and then I flew home oh wow and I puked in the sink <laughs> got air sick we are not supposed to do that oh. you puke in the cup so the new the new hostess got broke in <laughs> yeah <laughs> come find out that's what my wife wanted to What's what she wanted to do, but in order to get appointed for that, she had to have either a college degree or industrial. Well, she went to work as a secretary in Johnstown for Great Western Sugar, so she was on the way. But I put a stop to that. Because they couldn't be married, could they? Air, 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 uh... I think air stewards. Well, I know about that. Yeah. That's like my mother taught school, but she wasn't supposed to because she was married. Right, yeah. Uh, but Dad talked him into it. Uh, uh. Hmm. So you came back from California, and then you uh, went up and finished up at uh, Fort Collins then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Able to take advantage of the GI Bill and... Well, yeah, well, I actually, I should have... I should have gotten more than my bachelor science. I I could have gone, who knows where. But uh, all I was in, interested in was owning a farm, getting married, having a family, and uh, what else? Oh, finish my education. Yeah. 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 So of course, a lot of the guys that left when I did came back. And we got together again, hmm. Hmm. which was nice. Yeah. And there was always, like in the livestock club, there was always somebody that had a got a little story to tell. Don, Don Florsheim was a cattle rancher from New Mexico, and he'd been to the Philippines. And he was going to show us what, what they did to slaughter a... a, a Animal cut their, their hind legs, collect the blood, hmm. go from there. <laughs> uh. So that's when I got my. Well, the last thing I had before I left up there, uh, a guy and I were living in the Bennett Hotel and we'd bought a model A together, 25 bucks a piece. Well, he, he flunked out, so I, I gave me 25 of his share. <coughs> so even though we couldn't get much gas, I, I had a, I left that car at home on blocks. So when my brother was down in New Mexico going there, he had to have a car. So I sold it to him for 100 bucks. <laughs> uh, 27 Model A Ford. Wow. Boy, to have that car now, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, we are getting with it down there. <laughs> uh, it's probably in the junk pile. Yeah. yeah. But now. Yeah. So uh, went back to school and met this girl working at Great Western. Or uh, How'd you meet well, what? Well, that, that's got another story. Yeah, tell this story. I came home, I graduated, and before I got away from school, uh, they were hiring guys to teach on the farm vocational stuff. Well, I'd gotten my degree. At least I knew what NPK was. 
nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So they hired me to teach these GIs at Plantville. Well, they were teaching me really come to. <laughs> so there were Millers and Matsushima's and Nishimoto's and uh, there were 30 guys that I found finally got to. But you know, uh, if you're going to teach somebody, when they came home, they went home to the farm, which was their dad's. Right, yeah. So when you went to see him, you weren't, you weren't visiting him, you were visiting the, the whole family. So that's where I was. I, there's something I see they need to do. I say, now, this is the better way to do it. And, uh, so were you working for the extension? Then the well, it was vocational education. Oh, okay. Through uh, Dobler was their our head man in Denver, and then they had a guy from the Veterans Administration on that side of it. Okay. Paid pretty good, but but I had to spend so much time on the farm. I had to spend so much time in the classroom. Well, I had uh, classes every Thursday night. The first thing I do on thir on Wednesday is get a headache. And I never get over that headache until the next class is over. Huh. And I had some good classes. But I got sick to have them. So, uh, but uh, they generally had lots of help. Uh, CSU, the Extension Service, would send people like like with the artificial insemination, they send a veterinarian over for uh, soils. They might send a soils man and uh, had everything, uh, all kind of help. But most of these guys, but all I could teach them is, you know when to quit. Well, my cousin was from Longmont. And he was a lieutenant colonel with second Arbord. But when he came home, he had two two kids, and he went back to the farm. Well, he went to the then my farm class. Huh. But he he was a genius, really. Yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't for too long that he was the first guy that used art, artificial insemination. And. Uh, About the second year, he said, well, I'm going to have a sale. I'm going to go back to school. Well, he'd gotten his Bachelor of Science early, but he went back and, and got, got enough to where he was uh, taught at Hesperus, and then he was uh, head of the Dryland Experiment Station at um, Northeastern Colorado. Anyway, he was one of my students. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, one thing we do is, like, if you're in a dairy business, what should you do to improve the thing and get ready to quit? Okay, you test the cows, you give pure bread as you could, you'd... Uh, Check your feeds, make sure you get the right kind, kind of, do the whole thing. And uh, when, I, when I first went down there, if there, if there were 30 guys, there were 30 guys milking cows. But when I left, there was one. Because Denver, uh, who was the lady that was uh, doctor somebody, said you will store the milk in stainless steel. You will get to always test the milk for bacteria. Well, my, my best milker didn't have all that equipment, but he had good milk. He'd tie his cans in the cool water, get them cold, strain the milk into the cold can so the bacteria didn't get tense to grow. But they didn't want that kind of milk. They wanted 
when did you get, get all the up to date stuff? Yeah. So, fact is, I was even going to build a dairy myself once, but I changed my mind pretty quick because, well, what do you do when you want to quit? Yeah. What do you do when you want to take a vacation? Yeah, right. Like right now, I talked to Bernard the other day, about three times a day. Two, t two tankers of milk a day. Wow. So it's big business. Yeah. So it was during this time then that you met your wife? Yeah. Uh, out of those 30 guys, one of the guys had a farm down here on the river bottom. He, he called one day and he said, Hey, Dick, come over and go to church with me. Keep your suit on. Well... He was showing me off, see. So the next Sunday, he said, he called, hey, Dick, still got a suit on? Come on over. Got somebody I want you to meet. <laughs> well, they were, they were going to the same church, and he was arrested, and he saw that I was a loose cannon floating around. So he introduced us. Just before the 4th of July in 1948, and I did it. Uh, wow. Uh. And she was, da she was dating a guy in Milliken, a couple of houses down, and then uh, her brother said, yeah, he had shiny shoes. So years later, uh, I went to my Aunt Jenny's funeral in Fort Collins. This guy was there. He said, what are you doing over here? That's my Aunt Jenny, too. I looked down to see, see if his, shoe, his shoes were shining. They were. Anyway, that was who she was dating when, when I took over. Huh. Wow. Uh. Anyway, we met in the uh, 4th of July, and uh, we were to uh, Cheyenne during the Blizzard of 49, I drove them, I got them all home from Cheyenne to Milliken, a few close ones, and, uh, but then I couldn't get home. I had to stay at her house. She went to work. She was still working for Great Western Sugar. So she went to work. And I slept in her bed. <laughs> Short shaded crackers, whatever. <laughs> I said, What of you boys put crackers in my bed? <laughs> then I said, It was probably a week before I got home. Actually, it was only a couple of days before the. I could go down here to on Highway 60 to 85. It would be blocked. I'd go back up over here to where the prison camp was. It would be blocked. Uh -huh. And I, I was, I was on the job all this time. But you could, I couldn't get home. Yeah. Couldn't go to work. So it's all right. I was sparking. <laughs> so then, uh, most of our dating was going to movies and and. Uh, Discussing what to do now and then, and in the meantime, I was introducing her to all of my friends. And uh, like, for instance, after we were married, had these two guys come to the door, I bought a refrigerator. Show them the door, and he said, well, where's she at? <laughs> I had to go round her up. <laughs> <coughs> guys that I went to high school with. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm. So you met on the 4th, and then when did you get engaged, and when did you guys get married then? How long did you date? Well, that engagement thing, I took her up to Alt. Dad had been city attorney in Alt, and I thought this would be a good, good trip. <laughs> so I took her up to Alt, and I parked in front of a Judas store. Went around, opened the door, she wouldn't get out. 
She froze up. She wouldn't let me get married. I said, no. Okay, I took it home. So I took it home. I don't know how long that lasted, but she never got the engagement ring. Because <laughs> I had money then to do it. Later on, I didn't. So, uh, she had it all lined up so that uh, on one of her breaks in November, we'd get married, and then she had a week or so off for honeymoon, and uh, our honeymoon went to Tucum County, New Mexico, see my brother, and to Arizona to see my sister, and we, we had a good time. But then uh, she had it all figured out where she wasn't going to get pregnant right away. She did the first nine. <laughs> Brady was born nine months later. Exactly. <laughs> uh, hmm. So you were married in November of 48 then? Yeah. Okay. All right. And then married and she just, you said just passed away last year? Yeah. Yeah, so how many years were you guys married all together? Well, 48 to... 8 to 15 is 7, that'd be 67 or 57. 67 years, maybe. Wow. Wow. And seven kids. So seven children. Uh, grandchildren, how many grandchildren, great-grandchildren? Well, 13 so far. 13 grand? And the great-grandchildren, too. A couple. Uh, so if I live to be 100, I'll see a few more. A few more. Yeah. Now, I don't know whether... Uh, first thing was last year, I said, I'm going to live long enough to pay the mortgage off. Well, during all this process... We got to where we didn't have enough money, so I got a reverse mortgage. Well, about that time, the oil business started out east, and my dad had a bunch of acreages out there. So I I was going to take five years to pay, pay the mortgage off. Hell, it didn't even take five months. <laughs> wow, great. <laughs> So, well, I, I had to, that was after she died, though, that uh -huh. I got that done. But we'd already planned what we were to do with the excess, <clears throat> share it with the kids, and give her tenth. So what did you go on to do as far as a career? Did you stay on with uh, with the teaching, or did you get into farming? Oh, that was, that's, that's another line. Yeah. And when I went to Platteville to teach, well, uh, one of the families was uh, Dodero, and they owned a farm down there. Well, one of the boys is on this farm, and I said one day, uh, suppose your folks would be interested in selling this? Yeah, I'd go, I suppose. hundred bucks an acre. Okay. So I bought the farm. So it ended up being a demonstration farm. We leveled it. We irrigated it. We fertilized it. We fed cattle, fed hogs, had kids uh, from, let's see, I went to, went to Platteville in 1947. And I sold that farm in uh, 56 and moved back to Millican. But in the meantime, I'd had to have a, I was only making about 100 bucks an acre. I'd had to have a lot bigger farm to do it. So finally the bank said we can't support there anymore. So I sold the farm. And in the meantime, I'd gone to work as a chemist for Great Western Church. 
Well, they really checked you out at Great Western Circuit. I had a degree, but they didn't pay attention to that. They gave me a shovel. They said, you shovel that pig poop to start the factory. Well, this is barium carbonate that we were using to extract more sugar out of molasses. Well, I didn't even... I know that they made sugar, but I didn't know this or that about it. But the guy that hired me later on said, one time they were going to can me. He said, you got a job. I hired you. Well, this is Bob Monroe. He was a graduate of Golden School Mines. He said, I hired you. You got a job. I didn't know it. So my chemistry come out then. <laughs> so we made sugar. We made MSG. We made corn syrup. We did all kinds of stuff. How many years were you with uh, Great Western then? Well, I was. I worked in Johnstown. I worked in Loveland. I worked in Greeley. I worked in Eaton. Uh, Brighton. Huh. All those places, one time or another. But I spent most of my time in uh, Greeley or Eaton, and then they shut them down. But that was a good company. Yeah. How many years were you with them all together? 30. 30 years. Wow. From 54 to 84. Huh. Wow. So I could have, uh, at that time they were allowing people to work till they were 70. But the trouble of it is they, they keep giving you a percentage raise. Pretty soon you're way out of run with the rest of them. So the only way they get rid of you then was to pay off according to the, I forget what they call it. Anyway, a bunch of guys were paid off that way. Yeah, early retirement type of thing. Yeah. 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 But it was a good company. Oh, good. Yeah. And they're still going. Yeah. The farmers. Yeah, out at Morgan. Poor Morgan and yeah. Scott's Bluff and Billings. Well, Richard, as, as we kind of start to wind down this interview, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Or any other, any other of the stories have kind of floated to the top you wanted to talk about so that ideally we round out your story as best we can, or do you think we pretty much captured it all? No, oh, I think we got most of it. Yeah. There's always there's always a story that comes up. Oh, sure, it always does. Uh, yeah. Like, for instance, Chicken Landers was our youngest guy when, when the, after the Battle of Bulls, they transferred me from from uh, survey to water. So we might be out at night splashing water. Oh. And this one day we pulled over on the side of the road and was throwing water all out of the road. And it was a real straight road. Well, here come the shells following the road. <laughs> and chicken was back there. Laying the wire out of the way. We yelled at him, better get rolling. Boy, he took off running. <laughs> we were all standing by a culvert. So he run like crazy, dove in the culvert, and the shells went right on by. Wow. I got one piece of flak in the truck. Through the years, did you did you keep in touch with any of the guys you, you had served with? Was there any sort of reunions, anything like that? Well, of course... Well, most of the reunions were back east. So, but I, there's two guys. Uh, Don Kostovich was the company or headquarters clerk. Lived out of Chicago. And when I was back there, I was going to see that guy. But there was too many Kostoviches. <laughs> too many John Kostoviches. <laughs> so when I come home, I said that to Russell one day. He found him on the internet. So we... Come find out if I had a boy, he had a girl. If he had a girl, I had a boy. We balanced out. Uh, but uh, I never got to see him. Oh, boy. Uh. Now, the guy that I 
uh, got to know uh, Ab, Harold Abernathy, was from Hickory, North Carolina. Well, when we were traveling back there, we stopped to see him. Well, we were in the parking lot, and he was coming to see us. And I saw this old guy in the car over there. That's you, Ab. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. I don't know how many times he said bless you. And then he said, you know what, Dick? When you joined the outfit, I picked you out as my friend. Hmm. That was neat. Yeah. To have somebody say that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you he was adding to my blessings. <laughs> And you'd also mentioned, too, that you guys, uh, you and your wife, had a chance to go back to Europe, and were you able to retrace some of your steps of later on in life? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah, Robert, Robert was in the Marines, and he decided, to, hey, I'm, he's going to sponsor a trip. So we went to uh, Omaha Beach, <clears throat> and I, we hired a Frenchman text down there at 6 in the morning. Same time. Uh huh. And uh, of course, the beach was pretty well cleaned out by then, but that you could see where we'd, we'd been. And then we caught up with Jane at the, at the cemetery behind uh, mm. Pond de Hawk. The, the mm -hmm. uh, rows and rows of crosses. Mm -hmm. Most of us, most of the good guys are still over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I was going to do a, a classroom uh, deal for one of Russell's boys in Greedy. So I got all lined up. I was going to come in like an old man with a cane. And, uh, and then I was going to call everybody to attention. But I couldn't do it. Hmm. That was during the, the uh, I forget which, Veterans um, Day, that I was going to do that. But I was making fun of it, see? Yeah. And then I thought, oh, that didn't right. Yeah. So he did it. I showed him how I would have done it. So he did it. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Well, the, the last question I like to ask in these interviews, Richard, is uh, as you look back on your time in the Army, and particularly your time overseas and in Europe, did that change your life, affect your life, play a role in your life? Or do you look at it as simply just a chapter in your life that you went through? How, how would you answer that? I didn't change anything. I came back and did just what I, I planned on. Uh, if, if I'd have been a, a an officer, I might have done something different, but like my cousin, he came back to farm. If you were a farm kid, dang it, that's what you were going to do. That's where your freedom was. That's where your love was. Yeah. So you went right back to what, and so, so many of them, like when I was teaching, uh, it was almost like uh, I got to teach you guys to do something else. Hmm. hmm. Because the farm is changing too much. Yeah. Like these dairies now. My gosh. Yeah. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier in your, in your, in the tape that you know you said uh, uh, you went in as 144 pounds, left at 185. You said it not only changed you physically, but it changed you up here. Did you, uh, you you feel? Uh, I know so many guys say that. They left as a boy, came back as a man, uh, things like that. But you, you feel like... Uh, well, I, I actually grew up yeah. from Pee Wee Man in my high school days. Yeah. That's what they call me. Yeah. I actually grew up to full stature. And uh, if they had made me an officer, I'd have done my job. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't need me for that, so... Yeah. I come home and to be a teacher and a father, a farmer, a chemist, 
And I have uh, heard lots of people, most of them are women, were great Western. And then I was uh, Mayor Milliken for a long time. Were you, yeah? And uh, had more people to deal with. Yeah. And uh, got to know the Irish. My Irish girl. Ah. <laughs> hmm. Well, Richard, I want to thank you for sitting down today to, to tell your story, but uh, just as important, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, you know, I've stopped and stopped. I uh, think did we really? The only thing we accomplished is getting rid of the Nazis and a few Japanese. Other, other than that, War leads to war, and all we were doing was practicing how we're going to do the next one. Yeah. So rather than using a, a duck, we would use an alligator. That's like they used in the Pacific. Yeah. And rather than using a survey section, we used a satellite. All these new things. Yeah, yeah. And all those bombs we... Scattered all over the country. Most of them missed what we were aiming at. Most of them, them are guided now to hit what they're supposed to. <clears throat> so, I'm just waiting now for the next explosion, which uh, the, the Israel is probably going to be in the middle of that one. Which, of course, affect the oil price. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. This is a seat in Barracks in Plymouth, England. The picture was taken while we were there in 1944, before D-Day. And, uh, when we went back, we tried to take a picture in the same spot. Uh, wow. In uh, 1945, when the war was over, we were near Bremen on the North Sea in a little place they called Nordenham. And that's where this picture was taken. Okay. And that's where I ended up being master mechanic, and I got to see a French or a German gal come around a dike on a bicycle, and the wind blew her dress clear over her head. Oh. What a thrill. <laughs> <laughs> in this picture, I think it's probably up near in the northern part of Germany where we were holed up. And uh, you can see I've got fatigues on. And that's you there, right? The tallest guy. And the rest of those guys that are all surveyors. T Tally was a tobacco buyer in Raleigh, North Carolina. And then all these guys who had been in the National Guard and they survived the war to go home. And uh, there's only one of them that I've seen since then. Hmm. Other than that, that was a, one of my prized pictures because... I know whether you can see the bricks with holes in them. Mm hmm Shrapnel. Hmm. Wow. This weapons carrier was probably the best vehicle to get around in. That's Except the kind? this one got stuck. And that's the kind of truck you drove? Yeah. Okay. Dodge weapons carrier. Hmm. The Rhino Barge was a bunch of steel squares welded together, they were, would float, and they made our dock out of it when we were done with it. But uh, we very, made a very low silhouette, so they couldn't hit us with their shells. At least they didn't. So that's one of the reasons I made it. Hmm. So you unloaded off the LST onto, onto the barge? Yeah. And then the barge went into, into shore? Yeah. Okay. My my friend Kostovitz took this 
this picture, and he he saw those Holstein cows out there. <clears throat> he said, hey, Dick, you see those cows? You see the look on my face? <laughs> well, I'm not too sure what this is all about. They probably said, hey, Dick, get over there by the fence. Let me get your picture. Yeah. So that's it. But you said that, uh, at least in this picture, you're clean, so... Uh, yeah, I'm clean in this. They had this big steel gate outside the Seton Barracks in Plymouth, England. And when we went back in the <coughs> 90s, they had an old fenced in where we couldn't get in. <coughs> so I stood by the gate, and I told the, the guy in church, says, you're going to let me in, because I, I lived here during... The, during the war, so I said, just a minute, I'll call my commanding officer. So they did, and he assigned a man to show me around. Hmm, wow. Okay. Okay, this is the 29th Infantry Division, blue and the gray, north and the south. I was PFC. That's my stripes. So, said that, so each stripe was six months overseas, six correct? Six months in each one. Yeah. And this, this is the battles, there are four different battles, including the Nor Normandy, uh, Brest, uh, Central Europe, and uh, Northern Europe. And this is a French donation. I can't explain that one. These, uh, the red, the red is field artillery. Okay. And this ca these cannons are for field artillery. Okay, uh-huh. And this is the ruptured duck when we got out. Yeah. And I can still wear it. Is can't there? wear the pants. Yeah. They yeah. miss about the yeah. foot. But that's a heavy sentiment. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <clears throat> Very nice. So this is a site, uh, you said you mounted, they mounted on an 88? Well, they mounted them in the, like they took a house and opened up the roof, had the gun in there with this. Huh. See, I got them mounted here so I can go around. Uh-huh. And you brought this back as a souvenir, right? <laughs> well, I wanted all the time over there to get a pair of binoculars. And uh, the only pair of binoculars I could have gotten were hanging on the fence and figured there was a booby trap. So I left them there. But these when we were on the North Sea, we were watching all the ships going in and out. Part of our job. So, uh, we had our own scope, but they were using these. So, one of the guys that was going to go home before I did said, Hey, Dick, get your, get your big box. And we'll box that up and send it home. Then we were mailing all kinds of stuff home. Then that's how I got it home. Uh, I'll be darned. Oh, you want to take, there's R Roger, Rick, Robert, Rhonda, Russell, Randy, Rita, Dick and Jane. <laughs> Very nice.